Chapter 45 of Colonel Greatheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 45. Colonel Stow is ready. In the morning, in Holton House, the Lieutenant General expounded scripture. The commissary general honored him with the seraphic gaze of one whose thoughts are far away. The general was not pretending to listen. The sergeant major general was stealthily gone. The lieutenant general was moved to song, and Fairfax shifted uneasily. Woe's me that I in Meshech am a sojourner so long, or that I in the tents do dwell to Kedar that belong. Lo, you then, said he with indignation, do I speak vain words for a pretense even as the Pharisees use? Nay, brethren, verily, where is my dwelling place? Even in Meshach, which is being interpreted, prolonging, for the Lord prolongeth my trial. Even in Kedar, where I dwell in the blackness of my own sin, yet of surety the Lord forsaketh me not. O oh, sirs, let's make a joyful noise though he do prolong though my sins be as scarlet yet he will i trust bring me to his tabernacle my soul is with the congregation of the firstborn my body stayed upon hope verily verily no poor creature hath more cause to give thanks than i i have had plentiful wages beforehand and i am sure i shall never earn the least mite the Lord hath accepted me in his Son, and giveth me to walk in the light. He it is that lighteth our blackness. O oh, sirs, one beam in a dark place hath exceeding much refreshment in it. Blessed be his name for shining upon so dark a heart as mine. Fairfax crashed his fist on the table. The more I think of it, the more damnable I think it is, he cried. Cromwell grasped woe unto me woe unto me that you should say so and he beat his breast fairfax was much embarrassed good lack sir i mean nothing against you i was not heeding your very godly words my mind was upon the surprise of last night ireton woke up a strange business sir most surely a vile plot cried fairfax surely they designed to murder us but they might fall on a masterless army. You are marvelous acute, said Ireton, with something of a sneer. He did not love discoverers of the obvious. I would that I knew what villain planned it, said Fairfax. Verily, he is drunken with the blood of the saints, said Cromwell in the tones of inspiration. We will hold strict inquiry of this prisoner, Fairfax went on. I, Faith, I'll question him roundly and have the truth out of him before I hang him. Ireton, who had seemed about to speak, said nothing. We meet at noon then, gentlemen. They saluted and he left them. There goes the honestest head in England, said Ireton. Cromwell marked the tone. You speak with two tongues, Henry. Why, sir, none but a very honest soul would give a trial to the man he has sentenced already. What? Would you spare the Amalekites? His blood be upon his own head. I would have hewn him down last night, and tonight you would be sorry. What do you mean, lad? Are you riding into Thames, sir? Then let us ride even unto the Amalekites. What the commissary said upon the road, you may judge by what he said to Colonel Stowe. Better by the use of a pail of water. Colonel Stowe stood at the grating of his cell, trying to see the sunlight and the sky. Ireton came in with Cromwell. Colonel Stowe turned. You will come before a court-martial at noon, sir, said Ireton, watching him keenly. Cromwell stood off a little way. Colonel Stowe laughed. Is that necessary? You have nothing to hope, then. S Nay, sir, I have nothing to fear. Ireton's eyes were keen, but it was not they that made him change his place he felt the trenchant steel gaze of cromwell death said ireton i thank you for that said colonel stow and laughed again 
Fellow, you have met me before, cried Cromwell. I have the honor to upset your excellency in Newbury Market. Ay, but you were on an honest venture then. And now an assassin, said Colonel Stow gaily. Are you? said Ireton, and paused a moment. Come, sir, be plain with us. If we thought you no better than you seem, we had not taken the pains to seek you out. You can make your case, I tell you frankly, no worse than it is. But I profess I believe the truth may serve you. Let us have it, then. Who planned this affair last night? Colonel Stowe caressed his mustachio. You found me an assassin. I do not think you will find me a traitor. Be not deceived, Cromwell thundered. God is not mocked. Truly, sir, no, nor are you God. I should be glad to know of whom you took your orders, said Ireton. I do not doubt it the least, said Colonel Stowe amiably. Ireland linked and unlinked his fingers, watching steadily. I should be glad to know by what road you came to Holton House, where you passed our outpost. But I cannot express how little I want to tell you. Man, man, cried Cromwell, are you ready to die? God knows, sir, but I have no desire to live. Bethink you of the damnation of hell. Sir, it can be no more disappointing than the damnation of life. Cromwell made a gesture of casting him off. You do not take us friendly, sir, said Ireton in mild complaint. Colonel Stowe laughed. Dear sir, it is not my vocation. And yet you stood our friend last night, said Ireton sharply, and was not sure whether the Colonel Stowe hesitated a little. Why, if you can believe that, you can believe anything, laughed Colonel Stowe. Pray, why did you fire those shots? Each moment I regret more heartily that I missed you. You were not firing at us. Colonel Stowe appeared amazed. Good sir, do you think me out of my wits? Prithee, was I shouting at the popinjay or the morning star? Ireton frowned. Do you tell me you came to murder us? Does your intelligence need telling? I think you are strangely anxious to be hanged, sir. Sir, conceive that I ask nothing of you and will take nothing from you. I have done. Then, sir, my faith, this tone means death. I thank you, said Colonel Stow. Ireton stood looking at him a long while, his brow bent, striving plainly with an enigma. Cromwell plucked at his arm, and they went out. Ireton began to speak and checked himself. What now, said Cromwell? Sir, I doubt I have been wrong. It is naught but a reckless bravo who values his own life cheap as in others. Say you so. I profess I have no kindness for this liberty. Sure, sir, it is worthless soul that spends itself on witty answers in the hour of death. I have seen a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, said Cromwell. End of chapter 46 Recording by Gary Ullman West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter 46 of Colonel Greatheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 46. Lucinda is Logical. Colonel Royston was gone to his wife's lodgings. Lucinda came to him quickly. She was just risen. A loose gown, all gray-green like apple leaf, gave him the warm comeliness of her neck and all her grace. Her eyes shone softly like flowers in the dew. Her rich hair hung all abound. Royston, who sat huddled together, his head on his hand, turned and looked at her and laughed. Well, sir, she said eagerly, her cheeks flushed, her hand upon her trembling bosom. Is it? Do I belong to a conqueror? What were you ever for but yourself? She came a step nearer, leaning towards him, and her eyes began to flame. Have you failed? She said in a low voice. He laughed again. You have failed, madam. You are beaten. There was something of hate in his grim mirth. I God, I do not know that I am sorry. She had drawn back. Failed, she said. I, madam, 
failed. We have sold our souls for nothing. The murderers were beat off. The generals are safe as you. I am no more than the colonel I was yesterday, or less if they fix suspicion on me. Odd's life it would be amusing. Which man would you fawn on then? Failed, she said. Oh, I have been a fool. Her cheeks were pale again and seemed to have fallen thin. Her lips drawn back so that he saw her teeth. Her eyes blazed with a tawny light. You, you dog, what have I given you? Royston made a great roar of laughter. Ha! Does it tickle you so? Are you moved, madam? Are you moved? He came to her in one swift stride and took her bare arms in his grip. She tried to wrench them free, struggling this way and that, panting, biting her lips. But the swarthy hands only bit harder into her flesh, and he smiled down in her mad eyes. Do you guess who balked us? Who has beaten you? Your dear love, Jerry Stowe. Stowe, she gasped. The straining muscles were limp in her hand. Her face, her neck were all crimson. Her eyes shrank from his. Her bosom rose and fell in long, shuddering waves. He saw beads of sweat come upon her brow. Aye, I am glad that you can suffer, he said, and let her go. She sank down on a chair and hid her face. Tell me, he could hardly hear the words. What was it? How? How? Oh, it's a sweet tale for us. Strozzi found his way safe enough and caught them at Holton fairly. But Jerry Stow chose to make himself of the party. God knows why. Whether the thing offended his righteousness, he is quixotic enough, or he wanted to have his revenge on us. He has blood in him. At least he spoiled the whole. I think he started them fighting among themselves. I know there were shots. Harrison's horse heard, and a troop of them came at speed. When I rode up, all Stasi's fellows were fled or dead, and old Cromwell putting up a psalm. There's your noble plot, madam. Where is he? she said hoarsely. Rawston flushed. You have an affection for him now, have you? You go back to his arms. Be easy, he would not take you. She gave a queer, cruel laugh. Affection? I would that I saw him dead. Aye, you ever had strange ways of love, said Royston, watching her eyes. Will you torture me? She cried, stamping her foot. Where is he? Where is he? That is the cream of the whole, said Royston. He was the only one of them taken alive. The generals count him one of the murderers. They have him in guard here. She drew in her breath. Her cheeks were dull, white, and her bosom still. Then he can tell all, she said in a low voice. He can ruin us. Royston laughed. Yes, we are proudly placed. We professed him love and friendship, and he betrayed him. Then we go on in villainy till we have to whine to him to hide it and spare our noble lives. Mercy of him. By God, madam, you have made me honor myself. There was wonder in her eyes. What is all this? She said with honest surprise. Why do you play at words? If he blabbed to the Puritans, we are undone. Faith, you'd not easily find another husband. Oh, words, words, she cried with an impatient gesture. What is to be done, fool? Have you no resource? I, madam, you shall be laden with me yet some while. We are safe enough. She waited a moment, looking at him full. How then? Royston gave her a wretched laugh. I have seen him. I asked. The voice was unsteady, and he swore vehemently. I asked him to spare us. Lucinda broke out laughing and pointed a finger at his shame. Devil, do you take it so, he muttered. Well, and how did the saintly soul answer? Odd's blood, I could wish he had bidden us to hell, cried Royston. Be at ease, madam. We concern him no more than any other ill vermin. He'll not strike at us. He'll be silent. He'll spare us. That is his revenge. By God, he could take none crueler. Fool, said Lucinda, smiling. Fool. Yes, I see him in that. Silly, mad, quixotic. So he'll be hanged then. With some hoarse cry, Royston strode to her, flung one arm about her and caught her throat in his grip and crushed her with ruthless strength. You fiend. 
he said hoarsely, and she bit her lip for the pain. But she put her arms around him, and while he heard her, clung to him close. At that, he flung her off. She stayed herself against the wall, panting, breathless, still all grace. Do you like to know he is alive, she said, laughing. Royston turned away with a groan. She ran to him and cast her bare arms about his neck and circled him with lethe, fair strength, and clung to him and kissed him. A little while he struggled to put her off. He failed, and she had her will. End of chapter 46 Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida Chapter 47 of Colonel Greatheart This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 47. Colonel Stowe is awaked. The story of the night passed from lip to lip, and the army was in a frenzy of scriptural wrath. Colonel Stowe became Judas Iscariot, which had dealt in Sodom, and must meet the doom which David devised for the people of Rabah. The good townsfolk of Thame were calmer. They chatted with delighted interest of the chances and changes and how all was done and what might have been, speculations which gave them sweet thrills of terror. It was with blent sections of romance and fever that the tale came to Joan Normandy in the hospital. She heeded little at first. She had her work. But a tawny sergeant of Desborough's coming to have his headdress woke her heart. And they do say, says he, that the lewd fellow they have taken his own brother to our Major Stowe, and as like him as a twin, which I would not believe, for there be sheep and there be goats. His head was dressed in a hurry. Joan Normandy, in trembling haste, with a wild medley of hope and fear clashing in her heart, sought out David Stowe. She was beginning a march to his regiment camp at Shabbington, when she found him riding in with other officers. He did not see her. He was distraught amid the talk of the others, and he cried out, Sir, I have an errand to you. He checked at the sound of her voice, saluted, and drew apart. She awaited him, wide-eyed, lips parted. Is it your brother, she breathed. David Stowe flushed. Will you come to the house, he said, and keeping his horse to her pace, rode beside her without word spoken. So they came back through the shade of the churchyard limes and round to the wide street. It was a gay morning and a mellow light. When he dismounted, his wife came running to the door, smiling glad at her name. But he was very grave. Why, I think Joan is always to bring you to me, she cried, holding out for Joan both hands. Come in, said David Stowe gravely. They were hardly in that neat light room before. Joan moved from Joy's arm and, Tell me, she cried, her voice quivering. Is it your brother? It's true, said David Stowe. What do you mean, she cried fiercely. He was in the attack? He is taken? He is taken. He was one of the murderers, said David Stowe. Blood surged to her cheeks. It is a lie, she cried. I would give my life that it were, said David Stowe. How dare you say it, Joan cried all aflame. Would to God that I could say other, that I could believe other. What way is there? He came with a party, stealthily by the night, fell upon the generals. What is it but murder? He was taken in the fact. The thing is patent. If there were but suspicion, if there were but doubt, he made a gesture of despair. Joan was struggling for words. I, I, how dare you? I cannot endure it. How dare you say so? Oh, a brother should love him and honor him. And you, if you have not heart enough for that, sure you know him, you must know him. He would not do basely. He could not. David Stowe shook his head. He was taken in the act, he said in a wretched voice. Can you say nothing but that, cried Joe Normandy? Have you seen him? What use, groaned David Stowe. Oh, no use, if you are so well content now. No use if you long to think him base. But what if he have another tale to tell? Will you let him be branded with this shame? 
David Stowe looked at her miserably. His wife's eyes, too, were full of tears. Oh, child, I cannot blame you. I protest to God. It wounds me no less. He was very near to me. But what help is there? The thing is plainly a murder, and he was amongst them that wrought it. Oh, he hath been miserably beguiled. But what vile court? We, we must pray for him. Pray for him, cried Joan with such scorn that the soldiers shrank back. Her bosom swelled. She seemed to tower above him. Ay, truly, let us pray. Let us pray for false friends and cowardly love and feeble faith. I would that you were in his place. He would show you a man's part then. You, you pray. There was a moment of angry, scornful laughter. Then in a whirl she was gone. Husband and wife looked at each other, and she fell on his breast, sobbing terribly. Joan, my poor Joan, but if it be true that who wants no pity needs none, they should have spent none upon Joan. She knew no pain. Her heart beat with a wild delight. She could no more think him false than herself false to him, throbbing to the vehement surge of life, passionate with faith in the good rule of God, all glad and strong of heart. She could not fear his condemnation. Surely the truth must be known and his honor proved. And now, now that he was captured and forsaken of all, now she might go to him without shame. She was almost glad of his trouble, if it let her serve him. At least she might see him, look in his eyes, give him heart in his loneliness. She had no trouble with the guard at the prison. Her nurse's gown was warrant, and half the army knew her well enough to honor her. Colonel Stowe sat at ease on his straw, humming some scrap of a ballad. Colds the wind and wets the rain. Saint you be our good speed. Ill is the weather that bringeth no gain, nor helps good hearts in need. And he laughed. The grating of the lock did not arrest him. There could be no messenger of good. A clear voice sang through the fog of despair. I give you good morning, sir. Colonel Stowe started up, and she gave a little cry of grief. Though he had done his best with himself, he was still something of a wreck. The slash stained clothes, the bruised cheek and brow, told her of the pain of the night. But he held himself gallantly. He was the soldier still. I am at your service, madam, he said gravely. She held out both hands to him as if she had some wrong to atone. You are hurt. And I had forgot of that. Can I help? Tis all a show, child, said Colonel Stow with a crooked smile. He did not take her hands. It affects others vastly more than me. Truly so, she said, doubting, disappointed. You should trust me. I have some skill in healing. I could well believe it, said Colonel Stow, looking down at her with grave, gentle eyes. But you must not waste it on me. Waste? I who owe you life and dearer things than life, you know that I do. Colonel Stow shrugged. I've canceled the debt, child. Have I let you, said Joan, meeting his eyes steadily. Nay, you must pay it to a truer man. The blood leaped to her brow. You dare not say it, she cried. It is a wickedness. Is it so, said Colonel Stow, listlessly, concerned for his own emotions, not hers? I mean the best for you. Believe me, madam, if you knew what I am, you would not linger here. I come because I know, she said quietly. Colonel Stow moved a little. Have you all the story, madam? He said in a changed voice, and his eyes were set and intent, roused at thought of his own plight. No, not at all. Ah, he drew in his breath, and the voice fell listless again. Go, get it told. You will not come back. I will hear it of you, sir. You shall hold me excused, cried Colonel Skull. And why? He flung back his head. Because, madam, because I am not longing to give you pain. I can endure it, sir, she said quietly. Colonel Stowe forced a laugh. You make me mighty vainglorious, child. I profess I am not now so fond of myself. Oh, sir, then you do wrong, said Joan in a demure voice. It startled him. Faith, I am glad to amuse you, he said savagely. 
His nerves were raw. You shall have more mirth. Listen. In the dark of the night, a company of hired bravos, whereof I was one, came to murder your generals. We came near to succeed, but a troop of your horse overcame us, slew many and scattered the rest. I was taken alive. I knew all that, said Joan quietly, looking straight into his eyes. You knew, Colonel Stahl repeated, staring stupid surprise. You came, you held out your hands to me, you knew. Do you think I believe, she said angrily. What do you think me then? Do you doubt yourself? Colonel Stow was silent a while. God forgive me, I did, he said slowly. She gave a little scornful laugh. You, she said, you, and held out her hands again. Colonel Stow took them and kissed them. She pressed them against his lips. For me? For me? You may tell me the rest or not as you will. It is so little a matter, I know. Colonel Stow let fall her hands. I have no right, he muttered, and turned a little away. I have no right. She laughed miserably. Why, then, I am shamed indeed, she said, and then cried out. What is it you mean? Tell me. Colonel Stow came close to her. Child, you must see. I have little chance of life and no honor left me. Truly, you put trust in me yet, but who else is there? It is a strange, fabulous tale, I tell, and if it will save me at the court, I doubt, surely it will never clear me to the world. If I live, it is for a known knave, an assassin. I profess I want no such life as that. I'd rather make an end. You dare, she cried fiercely. Oh, tis better to be red with sin than to be afraid of life. Honor, do you say? And shall it be no honor to bear the dishonor of men? Oh, sir, I think no manhood is proven save after the matter of Christ, which was oppressed and was afflicted, yet went on his way doing good. Isn't it not truest honor to be held dishonorable above men, yet do always the works of honor? Is it not that true strength and the way to win glory of God? Colonel Stowe drew away from her. There was a new wonder and reverence in his eyes, but she, all rosy and trembling, with a pure passion, her own eyes shining through tears, saw nothing of that. Colonel Stowe bowed his head. You are braver than I, child, he said. While they stood there, silent, she watching him, as a mother yearns over a child, the door was flung open with a clatter, and a sergeant's guard broke in. You, fellow! You ought to come before the court. Hey, what is your work here, nurse? Colonel Stow stood erect. What is ever a nurse's work, good fellow? A corpse is not worth it, quoted the sergeant. March. End of chapter 47. Recording by Gary Oldman, West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter 48 of Colonel Greatheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 48. A Husband or So. You have to lament for Beniah Jones, Corporal of Horse, a victim of early rising when al Sibiad was ridden down in the rout of Rupert's horsemen. He lay stunned and much bruised. He waked to life again in the dawn, with Beniah Jones fumbling at the pockets in a region of his stomach. Beniah Jones was upon the goodly errand of spoiling Amalekites, and such was his zeal that he rose before dawn to prevent riches falling into the hands of the unrighteous. It happened that al was ticklish. He woke to see the fat jowl of Beniah close above his own. His disgust is reasonable. He expressed it with a passionate zeal in a blow at Beniah's chin. If he had his whole strength, Beniah would hardly have risen again. It sufficed to bring him oblivion. Beniah clucked a little and became livid. Al Sabad sat up and blinked. He ached in various places, but laborious experiment failed to find a fracture. He considered possibilities. 
It was in the first place not a possibility to sit still. The next saintly plunderer might well have steel ready. But it was hardly a possibility to tell where to go. Colonel Stowe might be in a hundred places in the world or even out of it. If anything might be probable, he was probably with the Puritans or dead. Alcibad, who was a sanguine person, preferred to believe in the Puritans and remembered then that the Puritans had at least Colonel Stowe's brother, a pleasant if respectable person. Alcibad elected for the brother. So you can find him limping up to the Puritan outpost and inquiring after Major David Stowe. He was bitterly questioned and his answers so wildly ingenious that they sent a guard with him to Shabbington. David Stowe, as you have seen, has gone to Thame, so that it was late before the surly escort presented him. David Stowe looked the plump, bedraggled figure up and down. What do you want of me? My master, said al Sabad. what have I to do with him? You have the honor to be his brother. David Stowe made an exclamation. Then to the escort, wait you without, I will answer for him. And when the door was shut, now, good fellow, when did you leave him? Smoking his pipe after yesterday's dinner, sir, in his quarters at Oxford. I came back at dusk to find he is thrown into prison. Why? For quarreling with the king, they say. I go as you would yourself to take him out of prison and find that he is escaped. You remember a M. Gilbert Byrne, whom he rescued from you? Bien. M. Gilbert Byrne has rescued him from the king, and they were away together. Whither? I followed them on to Wheatley and came upon Rupert and was ridden down in the route. I have but lately come to my wits and seek you to seek him. He looked with surprise at the swift emotions changing on David Stowe's face. Thrown into prison by the king, David Stowe repeated. He would scarce be seeking a desperate service for him then. God, what does it all mean? A triple chime of the quarter hours rang over the town. He started up. Nay, come, come. They have been trying him long, and he hurried Alcibiade to the door. I do not understand, said Alcibiade with dignity. Who has the insolence to try my master? Man, there was a company of murderers attacked our generals last night, and my brother was taken among them. Alcibiade became stately. Permit me to tell you, sir, that you are mad or you lie. I am mad, I think, cried David Stowe. Come. Come, you must tell them all, and hurried him into the house of my Lord Williams, where the court was sitting. It is necessary to consider also the other gentleman in whom Molly was interested, a gentleman of more peaceful fortunes, but hardly less distressed, a victim of unrequited love. As the shadows lengthened in the first of the afternoon, Mr. Stowe, astride a full-barreled cob, rode back from his barley. Out of the diamond eye of the sun, a miller's wain was coming to meet him. In front thereof marched a lean man and a girl in no part lean. They were plainly at violent argument, being further extorted by a man on horseback behind them. Mr. Stowe, with more surprise than pleasure, beheld them turn by his yew hedge and away to the yard. He arrived to find the lean man unloading bundles from the wain, while the lady assisted him with affection. What a pox, said Mr. Stowe, not without excuse. Hey, you are the Frenchman who kissed my cook. Never, cried Matthew Mark, while Miley wailed the faithlessness of men. I am the brother of all good cooks. But yours? No, she has no soul. Then why do you come here, my friend? In few words, sir, hear a sad tale. I am the servant of your son. I can declare that I live only for him. Last night my colonel was cast into prison by the king. Why? I do not know. He swiftly escaped and fled from Oxford. Remained his property. Lest that should be seized, I removed it by strategy. Sir, it is here in your guard. Mr. Stowe said something to himself. And where will Colonel Stowe be gone then, my lad? Hellas, monsieur said Matthew Mark, turning up his eyes.
Well, who knows, said Mr. Stowe to himself, and drew a long breath. He has not a hasty mind. Keen and calmly, he looked at Molly. She will not be my son's property. Matthew Mark coughed. The lady informs me, sir, that she is my wife. And you? It would be ungraceful to deny it, said Matthew Mark. Molly made a courtesy in his direction and a more serious one for Mr. Stowe. Come in, come in, said he. You will be fasting. He shepherded Molly and the miller's man before him, but Matthew Mark lingered. When they turned by the kitchen door, Matthew Mark, on his master's horse, was already some way down the road. He waved his hand through the sunshine. Mr. Stowe stood still, gazing at him till he became a black speck against the glare. Then he wiped his eyes. Sure he is a dear, said Molly beside him, and I could wish he were not. End of chapter 48 Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida Chapter 49 of Colonel Greatheart This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gary Ullman Chapter 49. Colonel Royston Delivers His Soul In a long, low room of dark beam and wainscot, Sir Thomas Fairfax had gathered his officers. The sunlight breaking through the hundred diamond panes of the casements woke the scarlet and steel, made the shadows gloom black, played quaintly about the stern joys of holiness. Fairfax had the head of the table, his pleasant dark face resolute and something self-satisfied. To the right, Cromwell leaned his head on his hand and fidgeted and muttered scraps of scripture to himself. Ireton was beside him, frowning and scribbling over much paper. Upon the other side, old Skippon sat and yawned. There was Lampard, the square-headed Yorkshireman, and Fleetwood's lean fervor, and Desborough of the honest yokel's face, and Ludlow and Wally and the ruddy, comely Harrison, every officer of note in the army. By Ireton, no comfortable neighbor, sat Colonel Royston, heavy and still, his full face set in hard lines. Gentlemen, there is no need of much words, said Fairfax in his loud, frank voice. Myself was at council with the lieutenant general, and the commissary and the sergeant major at Holton last night, when a company of bullies set about us and butchered the good fellows that were with us and came so near ourselves that, but for a troop of Colonel Harrison's, we had been sped. It was at the same time that the king's horse fell upon our lines in a hot attack, wherein we have, under God, to thank Colonel Royston's dispositions of his dragooners. Sirs, it is plain this is all a horrid plot. They would murder your generals and assault a masterless army. One of the fellows that beset us hath been taken. We have him here, and I doubt not you will be short with him. There was a mutter of assent. Ireland looked up from the paper wherein he had been drawing something not unlike Colonel Stowe. And with your leave, sir, we may learn of him who was behind this plot, whether the knowledge of a thing so damnable touches any in high places. That hint at the king was relished. There was muttering, and Harrison cried out, Verily, verily, he is drunken with the blood of the saints. This thing is a low villainy, said Fairfax, with some disdain. Respect for royal persons was bred in him. Bring the man in. Colonel Stowe came in between two pikemen and saluted the court, looked calmly round upon eyes of contemptuous hate. Your name, said Rushwar, the secretary. Jeremiah Stowe, lately colonel of horse in the king's army. Sir, says Fairfax, I think you were of a party that made a murderous attack on myself and other gentlemen last night. It is within the knowledge of many, sir, and this was no fair act of war, but patently murder. I do not deny it. Fairfax sat back in his chair. Do we need more, gentlemen, he said with contempt. 
nay for it is written smite amalek and utterly destroy said fleetwood with unction it is also written that sinners make haste to shed blood said ireton sourly and by your leave sir i need some little more fairfax waved his hand sir tis within your knowledge that none of us bore pistols having left the same in our holsters fairfax nodded yet of the fellows who were slain last night two have bullet wounds the which i remarked to the sergeant major skippon rolled in his seat and so it is but there never was a fight without strange happenings so that plainly there were shots fired by another hand than ours and these were not let off at us in a venture no man who sought to do a secret murder would do it by pistol fire these shots were meant i think colonel harrison will tell the court it was the sound of the firing roused him to send his troop to holton you speak the truth said harrison therefore i present to the court that the man which fired these shots had another design than our murder he stands there said cromwell pointing with a big red bony hand across the table to colonel stow colonel stow saluted i thank you sir this is something fine weaving methinks said fleetwood with a sneer the commissary goes back to his old trade quote lambert this is a lawyer's tale another lawyer will answer it all in a moment the man was taken with red hands in a murder what's all the rest whoever knew a fight where no bullet went awry the man was fool enough to fire and fool enough to shoot or miss as he hath been fool enough to be taken alive his folly hath spoiled their villainy but i protest i have no more mercy for a fool than another that surprises me in colonel lampert said ireton blandly nay but there was never a fight without a strange happening in it said skippon and i cannot tell why they should save a rogue there was a loud murmur of assent they were not looking for innocence lampert's heavy blunt arguments crushed the lawyer's sudleys indeed no soldier was likely to need more than the plain tale one of the murderers lost his head fired was captured it was more like truth than any refinement it carried them away ireton glancing round the table reckoned the verdict with keen eyes and shrugged he looked curiously at colonel stow who surprised him by a smile colonel stow saluted fairfax sir i too have something to say why how now cried cromwell with a start and ireton began to caress his chin it is your right said fairfax royston moved heavily and turning at the sound colonel stow saw his face and its agony it hardly inclined him to mercy but for the sake of old years for his own pride for a hundred mingled memories and desires he could not give royston to death there was another whose shame must be covered gilbert bourne had taken him from prison to save the king's honor and for the king's honor died his own faith was pledged to the dead the king's part could not be told for the rest he was free and would fight he began to speak and royston's eyes were set on him in a grim stare of pain sir i thank you i bear a name of some honor among you and though i be your foe i have never brought shame upon it i would call to witness your officers who have had passages with me that i have ever observed the right rules of law then fairfax cried out faith i remember you you were in that affair by towcester i think sir i lost no honor by it sir i am sorry to see you here colonel stow bowed well sir you recall that in this present i thank the commissary general for his honorable testimony i will make a plain tale short yesternight in oxford an officer of the king's guard captain bourne came to me with the news that an italian bravo strozzi had ridden out on this venture of murder it was plain to captain bourne and myself that such a plot must bring shame on the king's cause that which we had in high regard but the fellow was gone and we could not stay him by orders 
nay it was but a chance of riding at the best of our speed we could reach you in time to balk him i do not pretend sir that we had any peculiar kindness for you we sought to preserve our cause from the infamy of this foul deed riding vanta today we came something rashly upon the italian's troop and in the affray captain bourne was slain he lies by the roadside on shadow before he died he bade me ride on for the honor of the king sir i did my possible i caught up strozzi's company as they were running in upon holton house it was over late to warn you i fought for you i did what under the providence of god sir was your salvation i would have you remark that there were shots fired before strozzi came within the house they were mine i had four pistols my own and my friends and they were all shot off before i was beaten down pray remark again it was not colonel harrison's troop nor your swords but strozzi's own men that smote me that is all sir let me say whatever befall me i did my part i saved you with a very pretty tale lambert sneered let's have less of worldly honor and more of god's righteousness said fleetwood wherein lies the one way of thriving said harrison with unction oh sir let's not be beguiled with the glories of man's seeking which are a fleeting show let's abide by our business said ireton sharply come sir this was well said and i tell you plainly it suits well with what i have seen but we must have more you heard of the plot in oxford did you hear who made the plot captain bourne told me of none but strozzi we knew him for a fellow of no scruple ah strozzi said ireton with a curious intonation and who stood behind strozzi how can i tell said colonel stow with a shrug he is a fellow that works in the dark do you know who devised the plan on my honor sir said colonel stow with some relief no it is like strozzi himself do you know any but strozzi who knew his design colonel stow hesitated a long while staring at the ground this was the very thing he feared but he had not looked for such damnable directness well he was pledged he would guard the honor of those themselves who would not guard it it ill became him to blab sir i am here to answer for my own part not others he said slowly ireton made an impatient sound i ask you again he cried do you know of any but strozzi who knew the plot colonel royston moved noisily in his chair i have answered that said colonel stow i warn you sir cried ireton angrily you do yourself wrong deceit is your worst enemy subtlety shall ruin you integrity never will will you speak i will speak of anything of myself said colonel stow i ask you a last time i do solemnly profess to you you have no hope but in telling all who was in this besides strozzi i have answered and i have done ireton cried petulantly and flung himself back and with a wave of his hand gave up the affair but Royston was swaying to and fro in his seat. It was time, quote Lampert. The rogue is but playing with us. Make short, make short, cried Harrison. Let him be turned back for a reward of his shame. Fairfax leaned forward again. Do you say more, sir? He asked gravely. I have done, said Colonel Stow. It is not here I am judged. I give you little hope, says Fairfax and signed to the sergeant of the guard but cromwell was muttering and trying to speak they were leading colonel stow out when royston sprang to his feet his chair went crashing down he stood erect the biggest man by far crimson with flashing eyes no by god no he roared i'll deliver myself he strode heavily down the room spurs and sword clanking and halted in Colonel Stowe's place. I'll give you light, sirs. Why is he silent? Why is he choosing death? To keep safe a villain that once he called friend. He would die for me. 
By the blood of God, I am bigger than that. Hark ye, there was little need of that, for he held them like men in a trance. Colonel Stow and I, we were true friends for a dozen years till I betrayed him. We were both with the king. I forsook him for my own profit, and for my own profit sought to ruin him. The lieutenant general will recall how I bought honor of him with news of a king's convoy it was my friend's command i came with a treachery and with a treachery i go i did not rise fast enough in your army i gentlemen i am a better soldier than any man of you save one though you have not the wit to know it well i wanted a higher place odds heart i was worth it there came to me this devil strozzi with a few thousand pounds if I would put him in a way to kill off the generals so that Rupert could have us at an advantage. I took him. It was I gave him news of your Holton Council. It was I prescribed him a way through the outpost. And yet, by God, you shall do me reason. It was not the money I needed. I would have given him no victory. You know who beat off Rupert last night. With the generals down, who would have been master of the army today? Ask yourselves that, gentlemen. He hurled at their amazement a rough laugh of defiance. But for Colonel Stow, I had done it. Those damned shots of his saved you, as they spoiled my plan. Faith, you may thank your God for him. Do you think there is another quixotic in the two armies mad enough to spend himself to save his foes? By heaven, I have bubbled you all but for him. He turned on Colonel Stow with a reckless eyes. He had put off shame now. He was his own master. Colonel Stow saw him smile. Aye, he has thrown me. I am beat. And now, so please you, he'll take my shame. Curse me. I have some soul, too. He plucked at his belt and loosened it, flung sword and all clashing down. That's what no man of you is man enough to take against my will. And he laughed at them again. It was his hour. He mastered them, the grim, saintly Puritans, who knew no fear of less than God, whom no reward would have suborned to his treachery. They shrank before him. His stark, rough strength mocked at them in wanton delight of itself. In that storm of wild vigor, their virtue was abashed. Someone muttered of that old serpent Satan, and Royston stood there, towering above them, heavy and tall, the mellow sunlight falling quaintly on his drawn brow, and the full dark face gave them the contempt of a mocking god. They dared nothing. He was far above them all. Even Colonel Stow at his side, watching him with a great love, was little matter. He proved himself upon them. Their wills were bound. Life was worth living for that. Ireton was first to break himself free. You professed yourself a traitor, he said softly. Little words, little man, said Royston with a smile. You shall find no little doom, sir, Ireton asked, sneered. What you can do, will it make me fear? Royston sneered. Then Fairfax started up. Away, away, he cried, flushing. Nay, keep Colonel Stow apart. Let not the honest man be defiled. Colonel Royston made them a salute of mockery ere he turned. Colonel Stow hung back and lingered in the doorway. When the sergeant strode to keep them apart, he held out his hand to his friend. Again they looked each other in the eyes, and so were parted, not in sorrow or any shame. The last hour had worn all that away. The tide of happiness came upon them, swift resurgent. Past treasons were no matter. The last trial found each man true. Their souls were free. They stood together, invincible of the powers of death, and glad. Glad. End of chapter 49. Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach. Florida. Chapter 50 of Colonel Greatheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 50. The Lieutenant General Speaks. It was Fleetwood who began devoutly whining. Why dost thou show me inequity and cause me to behold grievance, O Lord? Verily, though they dig into hell, thence shall thy hand take them. The which is a sweet and savory comfort to Israel, said Harrison with unction. Nay, but the Lord hath sent serpents and cockatrices among us, and we are black, Fleetwood complained. O oh, sirs, says Desborough, with simple favor, tis sure a great honor unto us that the Lord hath taken thought to preserve us from such a devil. At this Cromwell made strange noises, but when they looked for him to speak, there came nothing. His face was near purple, and he bit his lip till the blood lay upon his chin. Fleetwood began again. It is written in the book of the prophet Hosea. Ireton made an exclamation and turned noisily to Fairfax. Well, sir, and what say you to Colonel Stowe's part now? Why, by my faith, I have done him much wrong. I would hold it honor to call him friend. Honor? Honor? cried Fleetwood. Oh, sir, what a tinkling symbol is the honor of men. Let us ask if he be a savory member, and you shall find. A weaver of webs, a thing of subtleties, quote Lampert. Hear me, sirs, this corruption of manifold design likes me not. It is written, he that is not with us is against us. That suffices. It is written in the same book, said Ireton sweetly. He that is not against us is with us. Sir, let plain men be the judge of villainy, and folly pass sentence on crime. This is unworthy, said Fairfax sharply, and Lambert muttered, Why, gentlemen, it's surely clear this Colonel Stowe hath done us great service at peril of life, and that in the clean impulse of honor we have been hardly preserved from doing a horrid wrong. But as for the other, for Colonel Royston, I do profess. Pray, sir, shall we not have done with Colonel Stowe first, said Ireton, with the advocate's instinct? Why shall we find two mouths? Sure, all will pronounce him guiltless. Nay, sir, my conscience will not have it so, groaned Fleetwood. I suspicion him an Amalekite in grain. Oh, your conscience, Fairfax muttered. Will you wait your turn, sir? He turned to Cromwell. How say you? Cromwell started as if he had heard nothing. How say you, sir, of Colonel Stow? He shall not fail or be discouraged, said Cromwell in a strange voice of dreams. It took Fairfax a moment to apprehend that. Then he turned to old Skippon. If I understand him, growled Skippon, which I do not, he hath served us, acquit. It is my mind that he hath done us more service than we can well pay, said Ireton. That was enough. Desborough and Wally followed their leaders faithfully. Harrison had enough fire in his own wild sir to honor a knight errant. They carried it. Fleetwood and Lambert snarled in vain. Colonel Stowe was brought in. Sir, said Fairfax, we have done you wrong and you much service to us. I thank you. You are free to go where you will. I pray you west in this town a while. I would know more of you. Colonel Stowe saluted. Sir, if you count yourself to owe me anything, I would it might serve my friend. Fairfax shook his head, and when Colonel Stowe would have spoken, held up his hand for silence. You can do no good, sir, he said gravely. Colonel Stowe saluted again. Indeed, he had no hope. The law of war could not permit less punishment than death. When he was gone, Fairfax broke out in a hurry. Here's ill work to do, gentlemen. Let us make short. But the righteous gentlemen drew together with relish. Now there was no occasion for mercy. They were free to be the executioners of Jehovah, and their own moment of weakness fired them to revenge. Few words, said Fairfax. When I spoke first of treachery, I had little thought the blackest traitor was of ourselves. Tis the vilest thing I have known. 
a manifold devilish falseness. How dare we accuse the enemy when they find one of our commission double their villainy? This Colonel Royston, bah, let's have done. Are we of one mind? He turned to Cromwell, but Cromwell waved his hand, and the question went to Skippon. Give him a halter, growled Skippon. Ireton nodded. Fleetwood had no notion of so brief a verdict. The occasion was altogether delectable. Oh, sir, said he, licking his lips, this is a great villain, and hath deceived us by those deeds which he had power to do in the might of the beasts. Yea, he hath the mark of the beast upon his right hand and upon his forehead. But worthy, worthy is the lamb, and lo, we are preserved even out of the hand of his wickedness. For his sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembrance of his iniquities. He shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Yea, the smoke of his torment shall ascend for ever and ever and he shall have no rest day or night. Colonel Harrison, cried Fairfax, snatching at the first pause. Of a truth, sir, he stinks and is corrupt. He hath troubled us. The Lord shall trouble him. Let him die the death of a chen. I would all treason were as clearly known as this shall be swiftly punished, said Lampert. No man gainsaid. There is one voice, then, said Fairfax, in a hurry, loathing the task. Have him in. But Cromwell clashed his clenched hand down on the table. I'm absolute for life. It came upon them like a cannon shot from the unknown. They were held stupefied at gaze. What, shall we be more righteous than God? Will you contemn the penitent thief? Why, sirs, this man is in a higher way. He hath not waited for the cross and the hour of death. We held him of the saints. We had never known his sin, but that he stumbled himself unto us and made confession. We cried out upon him. I wish none of us may be so deep in sin. And now are we to use his repentance to his death? I profess I will go to the limit of my strength against it. Nay, this is to assail the majesty of God. Unto him the man hath committed his case. O oh, happy choice! Surely he hath liberated his soul. But he is not penitent. But he boasts of his sin. O oh, sirs, who gave you eyes that see men's hearts? I tell you, I have seen weak men endure with strength, strong men like to sucklings in an agony of spirit. Man, man, is it for you to order how the grace of God shall work within a man? He hath a brazen forehead, you say. Let him have what he will before men, so he will wear nothing but meekness and truth before God. And what if this very bold boasting be but an armor to hold men off from his private passages with his Lord? I would know who dares hold him wrong. Look to it that you judge not in a private anger. He will not humble himself unto you, and you are chafed. Go tell that upon your knees. All which may be very well, said Lampert stubbornly, but I know well the man is a traitor at heart. Ask Ireton there if he did not ever mistrust him, and so have I. This is but a trick to save the fellow he calls friend and himself, too, if he can. Of a truth, I have even seen guile in him. And now I am well confirmed, said Fleetwood. Are you so? Have you never gone amiss in reading the hearts of men? O oh, sirs, I beseech you by the bowels of God, conceive that you may be mistaken. Believe a man may not be of your temper, and yet acceptance to God. Believe he may traverse strange ways and bring forth fruits, meet for repentance at the last. He hath sinned. O oh, I... He hath sinned deeply, and there must be punishment. Sir, I declare as I hope my own salvation. If we commit him to death, I would rather be himself than one of us. If God had determined his death, would he have moved the man to repentance? Of a surety he was granted repentance, that he might have time to work the works of repentance. He is over good a soldier of God to send to death. Do I say then he shall have no punishment? 
Nay, truly, he hath not sinned unto God alone, but unto men, and unto men he must atone. He may not command in the army of the Lord till he hath purged his offense. This is my sentence, then. He shall be taken from his office and made a common soldier. I, upon hard service, let him be sent to Colonel Monarch to the Welsh War. There, by the grace of God, he shall approve himself. It's an easy sentence. It's a light punishment. Nay, speak not foolishly. What death to him? He hath made his peace with God, and in death finds all his hope. Life is the doom. Life wherein he must serve God in warring with sin, where temptation crowd upon him all day, and that old serpent lies waiting for his weakest hours. Life that is the trial wherewith he shall be tried anew. I sentence him to life, so may God do his will. That's best. The good Desborough was forward to second him, and Harrison cried out, This is the naked simplicity of Christ. I will not deny it, quote Fleetwood. Let the Lord be judge. Lampert shrugged. It is your way, not mine. I'll take it for your account. Oh, John Lampert, John Lampert, cried Cromwell. It's not I that shall answer for your sentence. So be it, said Lampert in a moment. The others followed, though you would not guess Ireton well pleased. I am out of all this, grunted Skippon. I am a soldier. Fairfax turned to Cromwell. You have gone something beyond me, sir, but I'll not deny you. Let him live and God help him. Do you choose to charge him? I do not see my part in it. Nay, sir, nay, said Cromwell hastily. This is your office. Well, have him in. Royston came erect, unashamed. Fairfax met eyes as fearless as his own. Colonel Royston, you have convicted yourself of a vile treason. It is the sentence of the court that you shall be stripped of your rank and all your honor and serve as a common soldier. You will go under guard to Colonel Mox and be at his orders. Royston was plainly amazed. Then all his strength was shaken. He fought hard to command himself. I, I do not know that I should thank you, he said hoarsely, but I thank you. So with his head fallen on his breast, he went out to make his life anew. When the Puritan fervor had burned itself out, when Monk felt the time come to change sides and strike for Charles II, there was chief among his aides a Colonel Royston. You can trace him very active and admit in the underground work of the Restoration. In this rotten government that came in that foul court, you hear of Sir George Royston very prosperous. And if ever you come upon Lely's portrait of him, you see a strong man, sated and weary, who rated life low. End of chapter 50. Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter 51 of Colonel Greatheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. Colonel Greatheart by H. C. Bailey. Chapter 51. The Last Inspiration of Lucinda. Lucinda sat in the twilight. There was not a nerve of her at rest. Her bosom beat a broken melody. Her hands were at work with her rings and her chain. She changed her cushions and her posture each moment. Royston tarried too long. She had no fear for him. Though he had failed her, she had never doubted of the final victory of his brutal strength and adroitness. She feared him too much. But she was hungry for certain tidings of the other's fate. To be sure of his death, that was the best thing life could give. So she might quench her hopeless yearning, win freedom again, be again the mistress of her own body and mind, and use their old delights. She hated him as a prisoner of his bonds. He dared impose himself upon her passion and chain her with regrets. His death must be no mere revenge, 
though that was sweet, but release, full freedom of all herself. She could not dream of love reaching beyond the grave. While she fretted there, sudden, silent, a man stood before her. Colonel Strozzi saluted with a grin. She lay back on her cushion, still and quite calm. "'You are bold,' she said. "'I think you do not know Colonel Royston.' And she laughed. "'Good sir, he will get you hanged as lightly as I breathe.' Colonel Strozzi continued to smile. "'There was some little matter of a contract, madame,' he suggested. "'And for hanging? Why not he as well as I?' Lucinda shrugged daintily. Faith, I know not, nor care. Strozzi came a step nearer. Be sure, madame, that you will not laugh at me. You are more amusing than you suppose, my poor friend. Yes, you have cheated me neatly, it is admitted. And now the last act begins. Last night your bel ami, George Royston, sustained the attack of the palatine i hear his dispositions were most soldierly in fine he shone resplendent but there was a contract madame lamarouse and this is not what he was paid for blame yourself for your own folly cried lucinda you were given your chance at the general's and you blundered it that is another hair my dear said strozzi pleasantly I choose to run down the first. There were certain monies paid. I am not used to pay for nothing, and I do not like it. The position, sweetheart, is this. George Royston has played double with me, and it is a liberty I do not permit. He will convey back the money he had, or I will convey the whole story to the generals. And so get yourself hanged? Lucinda laughed. "'Yes, sir, I believe that.' Strozzi smiled at her. "'You do not understand me, my dear. I resent being cheated. It is true that I may get myself in some danger. I shall not care if I cry quits with that dear Royston. Believe me, my love, I shall. If he will surrender, the better for him. If not,' Strozzi's amiable smile broadened, the more pleasure for me. Shall we hang together, dear? Zip! La, 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 la! He made the sound of the jerking rope and danced a grotesque parody of the writhing body. Lucinda watched very still. Why are you so bitter against him, she said. It was not he. It was Colonel Stowe that spoiled your plan. Strozzi's smile was swiftly gone. His eyes gleamed hate. Another of your damned lovers, he said. Your desires are too general, mistress. Then he laughed again. Well, he is paid. Fat Tom broke his skull in before the lobsters came. You fool, said Lucinda quietly. They have him here alive. Strozzi spat a hissing Italian oath. But you lie, he cried. He gripped her neck and turned her face roughly to what light there was. Do you not lie, strumpet? While their eyes fought, there was the sound of footsteps in the flagged passage below, and a voice. Mistress Royston! Mistress Royston! Is she within? Lucinda started up. It is Ireton, she said in a swift whisper, and flung open the door of her bedroom. Go in, go in! Into the Holy of Holies? Strozzi sneered as he went. Then she threw herself upon the cushions again, and composed herself with much grace. But her bosom was wild, and the heavy foot on the stair maddened her with its delay. It was Ireton. He bowed to her with a grave respect. "'I come on a sad errand, madame. Pray, believe my regret.' "'Why, you talk riddles, sir.' The answer is short enough, madame. Your husband has lately confessed to our horrible treason. Confessed? Ireton looked at her curiously. Ay, madame. Finding a friend of his, a Colonel Stowe of the King's army, in danger by his offence, 
He confessed all to the generals in council. There was a silence a moment. Lucinda drew a long breath. Sure, that is mighty noble in him, she said in a low voice. But pray, what had he to confess? Madame, you have heard that a wicked attack was made upon the generals last night. At noon, a court was held to try a prisoner, this Colonel Stowe, for his share in it. He told an honest tale, but because he would not say what he knew of the guilty, was much in danger, was likely to suffer. Then, moved by his peril, Colonel Royston did confess all that himself was a leader in this devilish design, having sold himself to one Strozzi, an Italian, to procure the general's murder. Oh, sir, what mighty villainy is this? Ireton did not understand her tone. Yea, and in the very camp of the godly. I, I feel for your shame, said Ireton. You are most gracious. "'Tis at least some pleasure to add that the court found room for mercy. "'It was held that Colonel Royston's honourable confession "'did absolve him from the common doom of traitors. "'Only his command is taken from him. "'He is to fight in the ranks. "'This is mercy indeed,' said Lucinda in a low voice. "'Ireton, peering at her through the gloom, "'could see that she sat at her ease, "'still and unshaken by any sorrow. I would only say this beside. If I can serve you in your present need, madame, I would desire it. He waited a while. She answered nothing. He made his bow and left her. She was much of a puzzle to him. But since his own taste was for a daughter of Cromwell, she occupied him little. In what torment he left her you may guess. If the pain in another be the due of pain, Colonel Stowe's griefs were well avenged. This last blow smote most bitterly. It was enough that he should bring to nothing her scheme of grandeur. To win back the friend she had stolen from him, he could have dealt no crueler wound. She knew shame. Each hour that she had made herself the plaything of Royston's desires came back to sting her pride. He cared no more than she. She had given her all, and at the first chance he turned back from her to his friend they made of her a wanton of the camp the sweat was on her brow and she trembled truly he had his revenge he kept his own honour he kept his friend's love ay she had won that friend to her husband but he made the very victory pain she was left to a common soldier that loathed her she moaned under the lash it was not of her nature to try the past again to seek how she had been in fault or hold herself to blame. She was a creature of passion and unconquerable will. Now the pain lashed her into sharper hate. She gathered herself together and crouched upon the cushions like a wild beast waiting to spring. So Strozzi found her. He tapped her shoulder before she saw him. You heard, she said hoarsely. It seems the bel ami has cheated me again. He, what does he matter? He is but a fool. Tis the other has beaten you, this cursed Colonel Stowe. Do you not see? I see, said Strozzi. Well, tis he is our ruin. He spoils all and gains by it. They acquit him. They honor him, these fools. Are you a man? Do you dare? Do not be afraid said Strozzi. She started up. Do you need anything? Are you equipped? Strozzi laughed. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 of Colonel Greatheart This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell Colonel Greatheart by H. C. Bailey Chapter 52 Lucinda Goes Out to the Night 
Lucinda stole out. Night lay heavy and dark, and the broad street was still. The new model army suffered no roisterers nor loungers, but it was early yet, and many a window shone with homely light. She had her plan. Ireton had been amiable. A pathetic tale to Ireton would doubtless find out where Colonel Stowe might be. But she had no need of it. In an upper room, his face sharp outlined between her and the light, she saw the face that haunted her. She shrank back into the shadow, gazing with greedy eyes. Ay, it was he. The clear peal of his laughter came through the open casement, and she shuddered. That was his brother at the foot of the table, and by his right hand smiling, demure, you may fancy the words Lucinda found for her, Joan Normandy. Hate spurred her shamed heart anew. She heard the pleasant, happy nothings of intimate talk, and sped away like a ghost frightened of human things. He dared, he dared be happy. To that dark chamber where Strozzi waited she came breathless. Only a plump gentleman strolling with a contemplative evening pipe had marked her flitting. I have found him. He is with his brother, close by the grammar school. I saw him through the lighted window. So, Strozzi gathered his cloak, that suffices. What will you do? Kien Sabe. I shall not lose him. Good-bye, my dear. He took her by the shoulders. You ought to have been mine, you know. I'll try a taste of you. He caught her to him and kissed her at his will, laughing at the struggle of instinct. Yes, you have all the tricks. So now, sweetheart, you had best know no more of me. My love to the next man. And he was gone. But Lucinda followed. He had hardly found the shadow of a dark entry when she was beside him. He muttered a foul Italian proverb in her ear and translated with a chuckle. But she hardly heard. Her mind was set on those happy people in the light. All that had gone before was easy to bear against that. Envy and covetousness of sex and fierce mad hate made hell of her heart. At last the happy folk were moving. They passed from the lighted room. Colonel Strozzi lounged across the road, wholly at ease, and Lucinda sped after him. The door opened, and David Stowe stood on the threshold, looking out. He drew back, and Joan Normandy came, little, grey-cloaked. Then Colonel Stowe. Strozzi saw and darted forward with swift, silent strides, his sword bare, hidden behind him. The door was shut. Joan put her hand in Colonel Stowe's arm, and they walked on into the dark. Strozzi sped on, and Lucinda followed him close. Even as they passed the door, it opened again, and Alcibiade came out with a cry, On guard! and bounded after Strozzi. Colonel Stowe flung Joan Normandy on, and sprang round, plucking at his sword. But Lucinda cast herself on him, pinioning his arm, and Strozzi thrust at his heart. The blade sped through Lucinda's side and breast, and as Strozzi went down with his spine stabbed asunder and Alcibiade upon him, Lucinda swayed heavily, and her blood ran down upon Colonel Stowe. He held her away from him, peering where the steel was set in her, but she hung lifeless in his arms. Joan came to him, crying wildly, "'Are you hurt? Are you hurt?' "'Nay, not I,' said Colonel Stowe. She saw Lucinda's face and gave a strange, passionate cry. "'She! She saved you!' David Stowe was beside him now, and Alcibiade was up and many a man hurrying. Colonel Stowe laid Lucinda down and drew off his cloak and covered her. "'Yes, she saved me,' he said. It was over. End of chapter 52
Chapter Fifty Three of Colonel Greatheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. Colonel Greatheart by H. C. Bailey. Chapter Fifty Three. Colonel Stow knows himself. Waking late, after a great payment of overdue sleep, Colonel Stow went to the window in his brother's bedgown. The morning mists were gone. Red roof and mellowing tree stood sharp in the sunlight, and the grass was a carpet of jewels. Much had passed with the night. He rested in a strange peace, yet hardly dared permit himself rest. It was Matthew Mark beside him with a tray. Zunes, the evangelist. Matthew Mark beamed. How came you here? Matthew Mark groaned. Sir, says he, recovering himself, I could not believe you would have the heart to eat anything unless I cooked it. Faith, Matthew, quoth Colonel Stow, taking him by the shoulder, you serve me mightily better than I serve you. Now, that is what I complain of, said Matthew Mark peevishly. You always forget your place. And the truth is, I came here because of a comely maiden, a demoiselle of honor, who surpasses her sex and wants to marry me. Alas, her one fault, sir, the fly in the ointment. And Matthew Mark told his tale, and Colonel Stow ate his breakfast. In the shadow of the church where she was wed, they made Lucinda's grave, and she lay at rest with roses on her brow. Royston came, but the grave was between him and Colonel Stow. There was no word spoken, for no help lay in words. Royston guessed the truth. But to all others Lucinda died in honor. The thing was plain. Strozzi was the villain. In a rage of revenge for his failure, he had broken into Lucinda's lodging, seeking Royston's blood. Balked in that, he bethought himself of Colonel Stow. But Lucinda had divined his intent, and followed, and paid her husband's treason with her life. Strozzi was flung to a nameless hole in the fields, and over her they set a white stone. True, noble heart. You may fancy Strozzi in that world beyond the grave, with his natural smile. Before the army marched, Fairfax desired Colonel Stow to wait on him, and Colonel Stow, obedient, found him with Ireton, a pair not often coupled. The truth is, doubtless, that each in his own way, Fairfax, a frank, soldierly Christian, with no taste for exuberant religion and a strain of reckless chivalry, Ireton, who loved the extremes of his own faith, not much better than the high cavaliers, and was feeling already for a band of moderate practical men. They felt in Colonel Stow a kinship. Fairfax welcomed him heartily like a proved friend. Ireton put on a reasonable gaiety, and Colonel Stow found himself comparing their ease with the swashbuckler manners of Rupert and the dreary haughtiness of the king. There was something, yet not too much of thanks. Then Ireton, since we're frank, sir, I have wondered more than a little what took you to the side of the king. Sir, I must allow you to wonder. Well, I have never been one of those who see no reason of his party, but I think it has been plain for long there is no hope of fair dealing in him. You are fighting for that opinion, sir. Fairfax broke out. We have nothing to hide, sir. Why should you? Can you fight for the king again? Colonel Stow hesitated, but he knew there was no reason. He was forever done with that cause. I shall not, sir, he said deliberately. Thank God for that, cried Fairfax. You are in the right, said Ireton. Sir, it's not you desert the cause, but the cause deserts you. There's no place in it now for honest men. The past is past. The only hope for England now is in us. We can bring back the law and peace and strength. Is it worth fighting for? Older friends of the king than you have thought so. 
"'In fine, sir, will you join us?' cried Fairfax. Colonel Stowe did not answer. Something in this kind he had foreseen, but he was not ready for it. "'We owe you no less than a place of some honour," said Ireton softly. Fairfax made a sound of disdain. "'Sir, you've shown us that no cause can bind you to dishonour. There's a matter above the king's cause or ours, the common weal of England. Only our victory can serve that. If the king were another, I do not say, and it's no matter. Now who fights for England fights for us. Still Colonel Stowe did not answer. Why, do you doubt it? cried Fairfax impatient. Colonel Stowe looked up. No, sir, not that. What is it, then? Fairfax beat on the table. Speak out, man! There is a majority and the first regiment, said Ireton, if all goes well. Fairfax stood up. Well, take your time. Let us hear from you tonight. I thank you heartily, said Colonel Stowe, and went out. He was tempted. A regiment in the best army of the world was a splendid prize for his heart. He loved his trade, and here was the finest chance to work at it a man could hope. He saw a new fortune given him, another life. He might yet redeem his hopes. Old dreams rose again imperious and splendid. How could he dare deny them? It was to play the coward, to fail himself. If he had faith in his own manhood, he must challenge fate again. What occasion so fair! Surely he could find no way of life so happy. The chance and strain of war, that was very heaven to his eager temper and swift mind. Aye, on all counts, the prize was good but he longed for it too much to grasp it hastily. Out beyond the town, on the level road, through the smiling golden corn he went, gazing at the sky in thought. Indeed, this fell the very matter of his own desire. He was hungry to prove himself greater than the chain of defeat and plot, to charge again in victory. The old boyish love of flashing deeds rose in him, if he did so much with that rabble of a regiment, in that welter of folly with the king, what might he achieve now? He was the better soldier by two campaigns, by a new skill in hedgerow and highway fighting. He permitted himself joyful vistas of triumph. Fairfax should have a good bargain. He halted. Why not? What hindered? He was his own man. He owed nothing to the king. His loyalty was freed when he was cast into the gloom of Bocardo. No man could condemn him. He had no faintest censure for himself. Yet he faltered. There was a doubt, a doubt that rose stronger and stronger the more he desired. Once before he had chosen a cause for which he had no faith. He told himself that this was mightily different. It was certain. To any soldier it was certain as day and night that the Puritans would conquer. Was that enough? Against his will he knew that he had no more faith in Puritan than King. He could not hold their creed. He could not believe that Englishmen would bend to their over-saintly rule. He saw no peace in their victory. Half angry with himself for a scrupulous fool that must needs be wiser than the men of his day, half sad, he drove himself to confess that he was made for neither cause. He could not believe in the king. He could not believe in the Puritan. Was it so much matter? He was a plain soldier. Nay, but fighting for a cause he could not hold, he had gone too near shame to venture honor again. What then remained? Go back to the corn and the cattle? Live for the plow? He gave a doleful sigh. Surely a man had a right to risk something rather than face that vegetable life. If he ventured honor, why there was something not base in the venture. And while he let the vision of triumph come again, he found himself looking into the maiden honesty of Joan's eyes. Well, and what of her? She had some right to command him, and she would desire him take her cause. 
if he dared hope for her beneath his heart, sure he must consent to fight for her. That was bare manhood. Nay, what welcome would she have for him else? If he denied her, if he refused her, he knew she would bid him go. She, too, went with the prize. He was tempted. He had come near the place where he had seen her first. The low, thatched houses of Chinner were close, and above them the beech woods, golden and gray, rose in one close army to the white edge of the sky. He remembered it all, his own gay blood and her passion of righteousness. Ay, he needed her. All the eager strength in him longed for her purity. Sure, there was nothing else in the world made a man so glad of himself as such maidenhood. He might take her if he would swear her faith. Take her and all else that he wanted still. End of chapter 53「his brother was waiting for him in plain impatience. Colonel Stowe had nothing to say. The general was to have made you an offer, I have heard. I have answered it, said Colonel Stowe. Well? In the morning I go home. He looked up and saw his brother's face. I am sorry, lad. David Stowe sighed. You were still against us then. Nay, not that either. I think I was born out of time. I can find no faith that fits my soul, nor no cause that I dare fight for. And so, he gave a whimsical smile, and so I will e'en go into my corner and cry like a child because the world has no room for me. I would to God that you were one of us, said David Stowe passionately. And I would thank God for your heart that I might be. Lad! lad do i not yearn to be all of your cause there's a thousand desires bid me join you and one above all well each has his own soul to work out unto the glory of god ay unto the glory of god colonel stow repeated forgive me lad i cannot find my work in your faith i can see no fruit in your hopes the England you would make is no place for common men. You put your trust in a people of saints. The kingdom of God upon earth, cried David Stowe. And do you not pray, thy kingdom come? He pleaded his creed with a passionate strength. They would beat prelate and king, and each man would be free and use his freedom to do the will of God. England should be a land of stern labor and passionate worship, with no thought of other matter. Ay, and not England only. The hour had come for a new crusade. The army of saints must go forth into all the earth and conquer all for God. Colonel Stowe listened, and his face grew sad. God help you, he said slowly. Oh, lad, we are not all Cromwells. Who else could work such dreams as these? We have to work for human men. Again the brother pleaded with him in the zeal of his religion, quickened by honest love. Plainly their cause was conquering. God made ready his kingdom. The saints should triumph and multiply and subdue all things unto them. In flashes of strange power he showed a quaint picture of a Puritan England, a Puritan world. Behold the will of God incarnate. Colonel Stowe shook his head. How much would I give to believe it, he said with a bitter smile. I tell you I have tried all my strength today to persuade myself unto it. I came near to cheat my own soul. His brother was silent. They changed a glance of understanding and lingered together a long while. 
"'Well, I have a good-bye to say,' said Colonel Stow. "'I am sorry,' his brother said. "'I am sorry.' At the gate of the hospital, Colonel Stow asked for Mistress Normandy, and being admitted, crossing the pleasant turf of the close, he found her. She awaited him, still and very pale. She seemed to have lost something of her charm. He had never seen her afraid before. "'I come to bid you farewell, madame,' said Colonel Stow. "'I—I I have heard the army marches.' "'I go home.' He would not look at her. He heard the murmur of bees among the honeysuckle. The wind stirred lightly in the treetops, and a faded leaf fluttered slowly by. "'Oh, I was told the general would give you a command.' "'He honoured me so. I find that I cannot fight for him.' She drew in her breath. "'You are still for the king?' "'Not that, either. Faith, madame, I am a weakling that can take no side heartily, and so slink off. "'You are done with fighting?' she said quickly. Colonel Stowe gave a grim laugh. "'Oh, aye. The sword is a plowshare now, and I walk in the furrow. I have done.' "'Why, why, then you will be quite safe always,' she said in a low voice. Colonel Stowe laughed. "'Oh, yes, I preserve myself. That's vastly pleasant.' There may be work for you. I, with the cattle. I did not mean to hurt you, she said, and her lip quivered. Forgive me, child. I know your heart cannot live with sneers. You have been the sweetest thing in my life. Believe me, I have longed to fight for you. But I cannot dare. Your faith is not for me. So here's an end. God keep you. He held out his hand. Her eyes sought his bravely. Blood stole back to her cheeks. You are in haste, she said. There's no more use in words. So? They must all be yours? Colonel Stowe allowed himself a melancholy smile. She too would be pleading then. Well, he had conquered his own longing. I am your servant, he said with plain regret. Had you thought I might want to make an end too? she said with something of a shy laugh in her eyes. Not this one? Madam, I would to God that it might be, said Colonel Stowe miserably. I have used all my strength to be like you. Oh? she was plainly surprised. I would not desire that. I cannot be of your army, of your cause, of your faith. She considered him with eyes grave as his own. Perhaps you did not desire. We'll not talk of that, said Colonel Stow, and avoided her eyes. Her sigh was something weary. I do not think God would have every man alike, she said. And truly, all cannot come to him by the same way. But surely it needs not that they should hate each other. I shall honor you all my life, child, said Colonel Stow. She frowned a little, and the wide eyes were troubled. One does not seek that, that another should be just as oneself. And on a sudden she was all trembling. If, if one were let serve, and he cared to help. Colonel Stowe woke at last. He snatched at her hands and drew her close. As her breast touched his, she was still again. He looked down into her shining eyes. She did not deny him, but her cheeks were crimson. "'It's for me, child,' he said hoarsely. But she cried out and started away. "'Ah, no, no, not unless you need me utterly, unless I bring you life.' He smiled a little. "'You are not sure, and we must not,' she cried in a piteous voice. "'Unless you are bidden, unless you can no other, I had rather die.' I have been fighting my heart all day, child, said Colonel Stowe. It's the want of you bade me take the general's commission. I have almost fancied myself puritan by heaven. I have all but played my own soul false for fear of losing you. You? she said in a low voice of a mother's scorn, and looked at him most lovely, 
smiling through tears, worshipping. It was you gave me desire of life again. It's no worth, child, if you will not give me life, too. Yourself. Yourself. She let him draw her close, and he held her, and she bowed her head on his breast. She was still and silent a long time, then looked up with a little quaint smile. You want me so? I want life and the work of life. I cannot find it without you. So. It is so, she murmured, and her arms stole about him. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 of Colonel Greatheart This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell Colonel Greatheart by H. C. Bailey Chapter 55 The Master of All the homestead at Broadfields welcomed them again. It was an afternoon of sunshine when Alcibiade found Molly behind a cow with melancholy. He accused her of it. You are jealous, said Molly, because I am going to be a bride. I can certainly never be that, said Alcibiade with a sigh. Would that I could for your sake. And I was thinking, Molly continued, of my duty to him. Poor wretch, said Alcibiade, and left her to it. He found Matthew Mark with melancholy in the rickyard. He praised domestic bliss. Matthew Mark exploded. I adore it, do you understand? I adore it. What more do you want? It is very gentlemanly of you, my dear, said Alcibiade. Matthew Mark snorted for some time, and then became pensive. Any man that is a man would sell his boots to be her husband. That is true. The cook told me so. She told me so many times. She is no artist either as a cook or otherwise. But I, I do not even have to sell my boots. Why do you think she wants to be my wife? My poor friend, Alcibiade remonstrated with such modesty. Every woman who sees you must want. But that will be very embarrassing afterwards, said Matthew Mark. Marriage, said Alcibiade, is a proof of faith, a test of love, and an opportunity for charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity, said Matthew Mark, suffereth much, and is blind. I have such good eyes. Believe me, said Alcibiade, they are nothing to hers. The more I think of it, said Matthew Mark with decision, the less I understand it. Tis the right mark of a husband, Alcibiade assured him. At which point Molly, who had been observing them for some time, arrived. My dear, she cried, holding out her arms to Matthew Mark. Precisely, said Alcibiade, and accepted her. Matthew Mark swore in joyful French, but Molly was trembling and crying a little. Fie, said Alcibiade, remember that you are a bride. Tis more than you deserve, indeed, said Molly to his shoulder. You may say the same of every man alive. We are all born innocent. Some escape punishment. Molly laughed down at Matthew Mark. It is his folly, you know, that makes me feel safe with him. Matthew Mark began to sing a love song with fervor. Thereby attracted, Mr. Stowe came across the rickyard and found Alcibiade with Molly in an ambiguous position. Why, my lass, quoth he with a chuckle, I thought you had made a mistake. If you please, sir, I never did, said Molly. It was a day of harvest. The sky lay cloudless and lucid, but pale, and on the near horizon pearly gray. All the air was still and heavy with ripe fragrance, and the cornfield laughed through a golden haze. On the orchard bank, in among the marjoram, Colonel Stowe lay and contemplated the world. 
he was little used to the occupation, and it irked. But the contemplative life was plainly his portion, and he set himself to it without pity. Truly his lines were fallen in pleasant places. The great homestead, all crimson and orange, the rich lands of the vale, golden brown to harvest, they were good to see, and sure warrant of comfortable days. Ease, it was doubtless something to give thanks for, but hardly the best a man could desire. He looked away to the hills. Vast in the haze and far they stood, like power incarnate, towering with bluff shoulders, stern and dark and bare, above the sweets of harvest. I, to them, his soul was akin. He wanted the hard life of power, to breathe the roaring wind of fight and, and break the crash of the storm. The delight of straining strength was heaven to him. He was granted the life of the veil. Well, one could take it with a smile. One would not employ lamentations, for one was already sufficiently ridiculous. A gentleman who could find nothing to fight for was plainly too good for this world, like the white pigs one killed before they were weaned. But it was curious. He had not been wont to think himself so superfine. He protested to his conscience he was even as other men, and wholly a man of his day. Yet plainly there was no cause in it to content him. More thought brought no change of purpose. He was ever the more assured he had done well to draw back. Aye, every hour he was less cavalier and less Puritan. He would whistle king and bishop down the wind for a free man's right to his own mind, and for that same right laugh at all the savory vessels of Puritan sainthood. He was confirmed in a zeal of moderation. But that was no standard to rally battalions, no cause for his England. Doubtless a day might come when the land might be weary of either faith. But there was no herald of it yet, and the daisies would be a flower on his grave before it dawned. He who had prided himself that he was not a man of tomorrow, it was certainly painful to be at odds with his own day. And still, one might take it with a smile, he owed her that. Such as she quelled all the regret of broken hopes and deeds unachieved. Upon her heart he knew the pure gladness of living, the joy of life because it is life, the most wonderful of all a man knows or feels. She, with her dower of purity and quick womanhood, what more dare a man ask of God? Ay, truly, in the days of dreams there had been wild hours of throbbing delight. They could not fade. God save her. God who gave her into a troublous world with little help. God forgive a man who failed. Well, it was done. But there was no reckoning between those hours and the new life. Peace had come, not of weariness or sleep, but that perfect peace of the freedom of strength. She needed all and gave all in utter faith, and that became the very life of life. Surely with her there must be joy and the quiet mind to the end. The end? Nay, there could be no end to this. The life he lived with her could not die when their bodies were wearied out. That was the greatest in all her gifts. Of old, death had been but death to him, no matter to fear, indeed, rather the bitter herb that gave life keen savor, but still, at the last, life's poison. Now it was something kindly and welcome in its hour. When death's task was done, the life she had made must rise at last in the perfect union which the world's way would not suffer. He turned to see Joan standing with the sunlight on her bosom, and her face laughing from the shadow. Truly the world's way was good. Colonel Stowe resigned the contemplative life. She was in his arms beyond hope, all fragrant, delicately panting, with dark roses in her cheeks, when, behold, won the noise of whose roaring went before him. It was a small, sturdy child, who cantered upon fat legs, wielding a lance of hollyhock. Sir, said Colonel Stowe, who are you? I am St. George, said the child, and you are the dragon. 
on which beast he then howled havoc with saintly zeal. Colonel Stow exhibited a decent terror. But in the very moment of tidy slaughter, St. George detected an impropriety. "'What is that lady?' he said in cold reproof. "'Sir,' said Colonel Stow, "'she is the dragon's wife.' "'You did not ought to have one at all,' said St. George. "'I shall take her white away.' At which the dragon wept. "'That is silly,' said St. George. "'You ought to war.' And straightway the dragon ran at him, roaring, and St. George fled with joyful screams, but returning smote the dragon a mortal thrust in the region of the lower shin, so that he sat upon the orchard bank and gave up the ghost in very delectable groans. "'Antony Jeremiah Higgs,' said he, "'you have been the death of me, which I think unkind.' "'But I have broke my lance,' said Antony Jeremiah Higgs. "'Make me another.' "'Sir, you are unreasonable,' said the dead dragon. "'But I want it,' said Antony Jeremiah Higgs, "'preserving the absolute calm of monarchial minds. "'That is certainly a reason,' said the dead dragon, and came to life. "'I,' said Antony Jeremiah Higgs plaintively, "'I am not allowed to cut things out of the hedge.' and he looked with intent at Colonel Stow. "'But I am,' said Colonel Stow. "'So you see the use of keeping dragons about you.' "'I will not kill you again to-day,' said Antony generously. "'It is a consideration. Lead on,' said Colonel Stow. And Antony Jeremiah bounded away. But Colonel Stow lingered to draw Joan to his side. Slowly they went smiling at the child, silent. Joan blushed, and yielding all herself to Colonel Stowe's insistent arm, was held very close. She let her fair head lie upon his breast. She trembled. End of Colonel Greatheart by H. C. Bailey